Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and today we are here with the rebooted MCU phase 3 part 5. So in the last episode we dealt with Infinity War and in this episode we're going to be talking about projects 10 and 11 of our rebooted MCU. So just like I've been saying, let's just jump right into it. Not much more to cover. So here we go. The 10th project of rebooted MCU Phase 3 is Ant-Man and the Wasp Microverse. The movie opens up in the past with an impressive looking building with the title of Star Enterprises on the outside. We cut inside where we see a number of people sitting around looking at some sort of huge machine. We cut to see a shorter balding man by the name of Dr. Elias Starr, played by Rain Wilson, who announces to the group, The Microversal Entry Point will be the first step in advancing human evolution. If the Foster Star theory is correct, we can unlock a whole new level of energy for human consumption on levels never before seen. Dr. Bill Foster, played by Keith David, walks beside Star and says, This quantum energy, based on our calculations, contains healing properties that can be used to cure a number of human diseases, enhance our crops, and generate prosperity around the world. And you all get to see it for the first time. The future, here today. Dr. Star speaks. Before we start, I want to give a shout out to my lovely wife and beautiful daughter, Ava, who are here supporting me today. I couldn't do this without them. Star waves to the crowd where we see Catherine Star, played by Rashida Jones, and a young Ava Star, played by Raylan Bratton, who wave back. We watch as Star and Foster put on protective gear and switch on the microversal entry point. The machine starts shaking. But then the shaking gets out of control and the entire building starts to sway. We watch as everyone attempts to escape the room while Star and Foster attempt to stop the machine. We see that Ava breaks away from her mother and runs towards Star, screaming, Daddy! Dr. Star realizes what is happening and dives on top of his daughter as the machine explodes. Things cut to black and the title card appears on screen. We hear an alarm clock go off as we see Hank Pym, played by John Krasinski, sit up in bed and yawn loudly and says, Morning, honey, as we see Janet Van Dyne, played by Emily Blunt, lying next to him, who says, Ten more minutes, please. We watch Hank's daily routine of making breakfast, reading the paper, and taking out the trash. We notice that both Hank and Janet have ankle monitors on. They also now live on the outskirts of New York in a small home. We see Hank walk back in from taking out the trash, and Janet remarks, Do you think it's time to check in? Hank shrugs and says, Sure. We see Janet make a phone call and, and an unknown man answers. Hey, Eric, she says, as a man on the other line is revealed to be none other than Eric O'Grady, played by Dan Stevens. He responds, hello, Miss Van Dyne, how are you today? The two exchange pleasantries and Janet asks how things are going at PIM Technologies. Find out that as a result of their plea deal, Hank and Janet were not allowed to work at PIM Technologies while they were under house arrest, which caused them to hire Eric O'Grady a former S.H.I.E.L.D. scientist, to oversee operations while they are unable to work. Janet invites Eric over for lunch, and Hank chimes in, Yes, Eric, please come for lunch. I have something I'd like for you to help me with regarding our small side project. Eric agrees, and Hank walks downstairs to the basement. In the basement, we see a small box in the center of the room. Hank turns on the lights and takes out a small remote from his pocket, and when he clicks it, the box grows large, and we see that Hank is attempting to build a microversal entry point, similar to the one we saw Star and Foster with at the start of the movie. He pulls up their original design on his computer, and we see him start to work. We can tell that a few hours have passed as we hear Janet call from the kitchen, Hank, Eric is here for lunch, why don't you go meet him at the gate? Hank puts down a wrench and walks upstairs and meets Eric outside, when he goes to open up the gate for Eric, we see that Hank's ankle monitor starts beeping and Hank moans. We cut to a bit later with Hank, Janet, and Eric sitting in the kitchen as Jimmy Woo, played by Randall Park, and Usman, played by Divian Ladwa, are searching the house. Hank assures Woo that he was simply opening the gate for Eric when the monitor went across the line. We see Usman walk into the basement and calls for Woo. Jimmy, you might want to see this. The four walk downstairs and catch a glimpse of the microversal entry point, and Hank explains what it is. Wu seems cautious, but says, Well, Mr. Pym, you aren't technically breaking any agreements of your plea deal, but I encourage you to be careful with what you do. You only have two days left until you're free, so don't blow it. We see Wu and Usman leave as Janet apologizes to Eric for the inconvenience. As Janet begins setting the table for the delayed lunch, 
We see as Hank calls Eric to follow him down to his lab. Janet seems a bit annoyed, but ultimately just lets it slide. As we see Usman and Wu leave the home, Usman tells Wu that he is just going to walk back to the station, saying that he needs his exercise. As we watch Wu drive away, Usman gets out his phone, dials a number, and says, Boss, we got something big. Cut to an older Dr. Elias Star, who is walking into a desolate building. Star looks disheveled, like he hasn't shaved in days, and like he has not gotten any sleep. As he walks into the building, we see Foster sitting at a table with a well-dressed man. The well-dressed man says, Ah, Dr. Star, how's my favorite client today? Look at me, responds Star. As good as you can when you are broke and desperate, Sonny. The well-dressed man is revealed to be Sonny Birch, played by Walter Goggins, who laughs and says, Come on now, Dr. Star, have a seat. We see Star sit down as Foster pats him on the back. Birch continues, Now, Dr. Star, Dr. Foster... You're both falling behind on your payments again, which has left me rather displeased. We find out that following the accident at Star Labs, Dr. Star and Dr. Foster lost all their funding and went broke. Birch, a wealthy business investor, decided to help the two out. Star says, look, Sonny, I know, but you already have my daughter doing your dirty work for you. Sonny looks at him. Yeah, Little Eva has become a very skilled killer, Dr. Star. With her quantum phasing and all, she has made sure that my investment portfolio keeps expanding. Dr. Foster speaks up. Sonny, you do realize that the prototype quantum tunnel is the only thing preventing Ava from completely disappearing. Sonny chuckles. I do know that, but I'm thinking about my bottom line here, friends. Your quantum tunnel does not yield enough energy to provide me access to the new field of energy. So Ava lives... My pockets remain lighter than they should. See the problem here, gentlemen? Star rolls his eyes and says, Look, Sonny, I'm not here to let you tell me how much of a failure I am. Why'd you call us? Sonny pauses. Fine, fine. Well, according to one of my undercover operatives, Mr. Hank Pym seems to be building a microversal access point in his basement. And, well, it would be a lot cheaper for me to get one already built than have to worry about leaving it to you two to figure out. Star and Foster look at each other in shock, and Foster says, Wait, hold on now. What exactly do you want us to do? Sonny leans back in his chair. Well, gentlemen, you're going to steal it for me and bring it back here. Star laughs. Are you kidding me? You want us to fight an Avenger? With what exactly? Suddenly, we see an elderly man enter the room. My friends, this is Lyle Getz, played by John Glazer, the new head of AIM. He is something that could be of use to us. Getz explains that since Pym and Van Dyne defeated Modoc and Yellowjacket, AIM has gone down the tubes financially and they are in desperate need of assistance. He notes that while he hates working with a borderline crime boss like Birch, Birch agreed to give AIM 25% profits of the quantum energy sales. What exactly are you giving us for such a valuable asset, remarks Foster. Getz places a briefcase on the table and opens it up. It is revealed to have a preserved yellow jacket suit and a vat of PIM particles. I preserved this after the destruction of Cross Enterprises. I thought that this could be used to help fight our mutual enemy. Birch looks across the table and asks Foster and Star, so, gentlemen, do we have a deal? Foster nods, but Star speaks up and says, Yes, on one condition. Once we're done with this, my daughter no longer works for you. She can return home from fighting, and she can have her life back. Birch rolls his eyes. Whatever, you egghead. You and Foster are headed to the Pym residence tomorrow morning. So I expect this yellow jacket suit to be finished and repurposed to fighting condition by tomorrow morning. I'll see you then. Star and Foster nod as Birch and Getz both get up and walk away. We cut to Hank working downstairs in his lab. Janet walks down in her pajamas and says, Henry Pym, it is one in the morning. I thought you said you were going to come to bed three hours ago. We see Hank working on a piece of the microversal entry point and says, Darling, you know how much I love spending time with you, but I'm almost finished. As we see Hank throw down his tools in celebration. Finished, Jan, finished. 
He runs over and embraces Janet and says, I'm finally done. The microversal entry point is complete. Janet smiles and says, I'm proud of you, Hank. You busted your butt working on this, all for the sake of the human race. I love you. Hank pauses and says, Janet, that's not entirely true. I did this for you, so we can have time together. Yes, I have an obligation to the people of Earth, but everything I do, I do because I know I get one step closer to being with you. Everything I do, I do for you. I love you. So we see Janet get teary-eyed, the couple kiss, and they return upstairs for the night. Somewhere else in New York, we cut back to Dr. Foster and Dr. Starr in the abandoned building working on the yellow jacket suit. We watch as Dr. Starr pulls the stingers off the back of the suit while Foster starts chuckling. Egghead. Dr. Egghead. I can't believe Sonny called you Dr. Egghead. I really hope nobody ever thinks that's a good idea for a nickname. Dr. Starr laughs. Yeah, I can't imagine what idiot would think the name Dr. Egghead would be a good name. For anyone! All of a sudden, we see a girl walk into the building and says, Hey, Dad. Star drops his stuff and in shock says, Ava? As he runs to give her a hug, we see a grown Ava Star, played by Hannah John Kamen, who is phasing a bit but embraces her dad and asks what the two are working on. Star explains the situation to his daughter, who looks concerned and says, Dad, why are you doing this? This is completely out of character. Star places his, plant, his hands on her shoulder and says, I'm doing this for you, Ava. I want you to live a normal life. I'm the reason you got into this mess, and I intend to be the reason you get out of it. Ava smiles and says, Dad, I love you. Just be careful. Star nods and walks back to the suit as Ava asks, So what is this anyways? Foster explains, Well, we repurposed this yellow jacket suit into our own kind of suit. However, this one doesn't shrink. We watch the archive footage of when Van Dyne grew giant at Cross Enterprises and from when Pin turned giant fighting at the airport. Recalculating the formula and the formation of the Pin particle, we can double my size and strength. Star laughs and looks at Ava. In other words, if Pim is going to be David, Foster will be Goliath. Ava smiles and walks away as we see Star and Foster continue to work. We watch the next morning as Hank and Janet are having coffee and breakfast in the kitchen of their home. We see that there is a calendar hanging on the fridge which shows that tomorrow is a day they are set to be released from house arrest. Suddenly we watch as a, pan as a van pulls up in front of the Pym residence and we see Star and Foster walk up to the front door. Star knocks on the door and Pym answers. Star looks at him and says, Hello, Dr. Pym. Dr. Star? says Hank. What are you doing here? Coming for something you stole from us. Where's your microversal entry point? Whoa, no way I'm going to give that to you, laughs Hank as we see Janet stand up from the table. Oh, you don't have a choice, says Foster as we see him activate his new redesigned suit and he grows in size, breaking the roof of the Pym household and punches Hank and Janet, knocking them out. Watch as Star walks downstairs and finds Pym's remote, shrinks the entry point, grabs it, and shouts to Foster, Let's move! As Foster shrinks down, we see both he and Star hop back in the van and escape. We see that a few hours have passed and Hank and Janet are sitting with Jimmy Woo inside their home. Hank has an ice pack on his face and Janet is bandaged up. We see that the ants are rebuilding the destroyed part of the Pym household and Woo watches. He says, wow, that is either incredibly efficient or incredibly disgusting. He continues, so you are positive it was Dr. Elias Starr and Dr. Bill Foster? Hank and Janet nod. Any possible motivation, asks Wu. Maybe because I was using their design to perfect their microversal entry point, but that still doesn't leave me with a true potential motive. M Wu stands up. Well, leave that to the experts. I guess one good thing is that because the Department of State seized all your armor for safekeeping, you don't have to worry about taking this fight into your own hands. I'll be back here tomorrow morning to take those ankle monitors off. Mr. Pym, Miss Van Dyne, your sentence is almost up. As he watch we walk outside and get into his car and drive away, Janet looks at Hank. What are we going to do? Hank smiles. Well, honey, you know I'm something of a genius, right? As you see Hank pull out a GPS tracking device from his pocket that shows the location of the microversal entry point. Janet smiles. That's wonderful, Henry, but how exactly are we going to get that back? We can't leave our home. 
Hank motions to two ants who are walking towards them. He clicks the remote on his wrists, and two ants grow to be the size of Hank and Janet. What the? screams Janet. Hank explains that he's been working on a pin backpack that he gives to ants, which will allow them to grow into their same size, and he's also programmed these ants to act as humans would, which would keep Wu and the state's office off of their trail. All we need to do is place these ankle monitors on the ants, and we can go. Janet looks annoyed and says, So, all this time, we could have left the house, yet you're going to tell me this groundbreaking news, and we only have one day left? Hank chuckles nervously. Well, say what you will, I do respect the law on most occasions. Janet rolls her eyes. So this is all great, but how exactly are we going to fight against someone who uses your technology? We don't even have suits. Hank looks down. Well, honey, there was a reason I pushed that I was able to have access to lab equipment while we were under house arrest. As the two walk downstairs to the basement, we see Hank pick up an Altoids can. Inside, we see that there is a shrinking Ant-Man and the Wasp suit. Janet looks at Hank and says, I love you, Henry Pym. All of a sudden, we see Eric walking through the basement and says, i so worried that you guys were hurt. Is everything okay here, Dr. Pym? Hank walks over and places his hands on Eric's shoulders. Eric, yes, I'm so glad you're here. I have a very important role for you to play. As we see the Ant-Man and the Wasp suits grow to normal size, Eric looks at them and says, Oh my gosh. Am I going to take over as Ant-Man? What? Says Hank. No. No. You're going to be the lookout. You need to let us know if Wu returns while Janet and I go to find the criminals who stole our tech. Eric looks disappointed and says, Oh, well I guess that's okay too, Doc. Janet hands Eric an earpiece as Hank places the ankle monitors on the ants and says, Eric, keep us posted on anything that happens while we are gone, okay? Yes, Miss Van Dyne. Oh, and feed the ants sugar cubes if they get hungry. As we see one of the ants walks walk up, up to Eric and starts acting like a dog. We should be back in a few hours, says Hank. As he and Janet shrink down, Hank calls for an ant and the two head out to find Star and Foster. We cut back to the building where we see Star and Foster connecting the microversal entry point as Ava, Birch, Usman, and Getz watch. Foster walks over with a container and explains to the group, This is a quantum capsule. I invented it as a way to store quantum energy. It should allow us to bring back a sizable yield per trip down to the microverse. As Dr. Star goes to hit the switch to activate the microversal entry point, we see Ant-Man grow to regular size and punch him. You know... He says, I have a hard time allowing people to steal my stuff and get away with it. We then watch as Wasp knocks out Sonny, Usman, and Getz before fighting Ava, who reveals herself as the mercenary, the ghost. We see Foster grow large, and Ant-Man grows large as well as they begin fighting. Star jumps behind a crate to hide. Ant-Man easily beats Goliath, and Wasp is able to defeat Ghost. As Wasp knocks Ghost to the ground, we see Ava remove her helmet and begin to scream, as we see her begin phasing much more rapidly. Ava! screams Star as he runs up to her. She is phasing. She needs quantum energy. Foster returns to normal size and says, I don't have the quantum tunnel here with me. Star looks at Ant-Man, who walks over to the microversal entry point to unplug it and returns to normal size. Please, Hank, help my daughter. Hank looks back and scoffs. After all you did to me... You want me to help? My daughter is all I have. I sold the technology for her. She has become a pawn in a dangerous game and I needed her out. Please, everything I do, I do for her. Hank pauses and turns around as he sees Janet sitting with Ava and Dr. Star. He closes his eyes and says, Janet, suit up. It's time to go to the microverse. We see Hank and Janet prepare themselves as Foster hands Hank the quantum capsule. Hank notes that this is a nice design and tells Foster to bring them back after five minutes. Foster nods, activates the machine, as we watch Hank and Janet enter the, enter the microverse. The microverse is an expansive area where we see what appear to be pathways to different locations. Janet and Hank look at each other in shock by how giant it is. We also see what appear to be insect-like outlines in the background with possibly a few human-like outlines as well. Hank opens up the capsule and gathers quantum energy. As he closes the capsule, we see both Hank and Janet get brought back to the building by Foster. As they arrive back, Janet grabs a quantum capsule and, want, and runs over to Ava as Hank looks to Foster and says, I thought I told you five minutes. 
Foster looks confused and says, I did wait five minutes. Hank says, wow, that felt like a few seconds for Janet and I. As you watch Janet give Ava the quantum energy, her phasing stops and she hugs Janet. She then embraces her father. Suddenly, we hear a beeping sound and Eric says, Uh, guys, it looks like Wu is on to you. Police are on the way to the building. Reports of loud noise and flashing lights cause people to get suspicious. Hank looks at Janet and says, We have to go. Star walks up to Hank and says, I don't know how I could possibly repay you. You saved my daughter. Hank smiles and says, Well, I know how you feel. I also have someone who is on the front of my mind with everything I do. Star continues, I know I'm going to be going to jail. But please, Ava needs to continue having quantum treatment in order to survive. Please help her. Janet cuts into the conversation and says, Henry, we need to move. Hank looks at Star and says, you have my word. As we see Hank hit a button to shrink the microversal entry point, he and Janet shrink down. We watch as Ava jumps out of the window of the building as the police arrive. Cut to the Pym household as Wu and other cops arrive and beat their fist on the door. Wu eventually breaks it open as we see Hank, Janet, and Eric sitting and drinking coffee. Officer Wu? Says Hank. What? How? I, w I was sure. Wu remarks and turns away. I'm sorry, Hank. Something crazy happened down in this old abandoned building. Thought it had something to do with you. As the officers leave, we see Eric get up and head out as Hank walks up to him and says, Thanks for all your help, Eric. We really couldn't do it without you. You kept our company afloat, and you kept lookout. You really are the best. Eric shrugs and says, Don't mention it, Dr. Pym. Although, I really wish I was going to get to become Ant-Man. Hank laughs. One day, Eric. One day. As Eric's eyes grow bigger, we watch him pump his fist and walk away. Cut to the next day, where he watches Wu releases the ankle monitors from Hank and Janet. Hank remarks how good it feels to finally be free. Wu asks him, So what are you going to do now with all this freedom? Hank shrugs and says, Oh, I don't know. Probably going to get started on some microversal stuff as the movie ends. We have one post credit scene where we cut back to the abandoned building where we see Eric and Ava prepping Hank and Janet to return to the microverse. Hank tells them to bring them back up after 30 minutes, so it should be about a minute for them or so down there. But he tells them that next time, they're going to study for a bit longer. As we see Hank and Janet shrink down, we watch as Hank and Janet gather quantum energy and the two sit there as Hank speaks into a communicator. Uh, Eric? Ava? You can pull us up now. Let's cut back to the building to see that both Eric and Ava have been dusted. As Hank and Janet float in the microverse, the movie ends. That is Ant-Man and the Wasp microverse. Again, not too many changes from the first Ant-Man and the Wasp film. But, of course, since Marvel has all the rights to these projects, they can use the microverse instead of the quantum realm. So, if you are a bit confused, quantum energy comes from the microverse in my rebooted MCU. Just wanted to clarify that, but not going to spend too much time. I think, you know, it perfectly sets up what is going to be coming next. But we have another project we're going to talk about today, so let's talk about the next project in rebooted MCU Phase 3. The 11th project of rebooted MCU Phase 3 is Captain Marvel. Now, most of the movie stays the same until the very end, which I'll cover, but I have made some casting changes. So the first and biggest is that Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, is now played by Natalie Dormer. Now, I know that there are a lot of fans who are not particularly fond of Brie Larson. I did not change the casting because I'm not a fan of Brie Larson. I have another role in the MCU that comes later down the line that I think that she plays that particular role better than Captain Marvel. And I want to make Captain Marvel a lot more of a cheery and bright character where I think in the MCU they sort of portrayed her as this, you know, maybe not necessarily darker but not as cheery character. I want my Captain Marvel to be very cheery and really represent a lot of hope, especially when she's this cosmic character who goes around to different planets and is supposed to help them. You know, I think that that's what she should represent. I think Natalie Dormer is a great choice to play that role, and that's why I recast her. So again, we will see Brie Larson down the line, 
Um, she just, in my opinion, was not the right choice for my MCU rebooted Captain Marvel. Another character that I recast is the Supreme Intelligence. She is now played by Helen Mirren. And that's really just because I love Helen Mirren. And I thought that she would be a pretty cool actress to play in that particular role. So no real deep insight into why I made that change. I just think she's cool in this role. So with that being said, most of the movie plays out the same. So Vares, which is what they called Captain Marvel, of course, before she learned about her identity, is working with the Kree and specifically Star Force, which is headed by Jan Rog, who's still played by Jude Law, and they're fighting with the Skrulls. The Skrulls eventually capture Vares, she's sent to Earth, she encounters Nick Fury, played by Samuel L. Jackson, and Phil Coulson, played by Clark Gregg. Talos, played by Ben Mendelsohn, tells Vares and Fury the truth about what is going on with the Kree and about the encaptured Skrull citizens and members of the Skrull race. They go and meet Maria Rambeau, played by Lashana Lynch, and a young Monica Rambeau, played by Akira Akbar, who helps Vares recall her past, specifically that she is a former pilot by the name of Carol Danvers, who supposedly died in a crash after she agreed to pilot a new prototype ship. Talos explains that the Kree are garnering the energy of the Power Stone. They intend to use the Power Stone to destroy the Skrull home planet of Skrullos before selling the stone to a known galactic tyrant, which could lead to the destruction of the entire galaxy. Talos explains that the Skrulls hope to protect the Power Stone by safeguarding it on a planet inhabited with Skrull allies called the Brood. So Danvers, Fury, Rambo, and Talos all go up to space and face off against the Kree. During the battle, we see Nick Fury has his eye scratched out by a Kree soldier. Goose the Flurkin does not appear in this movie. Danvers removes her inhibitor and unleashes her full power of Captain Marvel against the Supreme Intelligence. Captain Marvel recovers the Power Stone and places it in safekeeping inside of a Kree container. As we see a Kree bomber headed towards Earth, we watch as it is headed by Kree Captain Dar Ben, played by Aiden Turner, but is quickly destroyed by Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel defeats Yon Rog and stops the Kree from destroying Skrullos. Talos gets the Power Stone from Danvers and tells her that he will be delivering this to the Brood for safekeeping. Danvers says farewell to her friends, but not before giving Fury a pager to contact her in case Earth is ever in trouble. We cut to the Kree homeworld of Hala where we see the Supreme Intelligence, Dar Ben, and a defeated Yon Rog sitting in a grand hall. Suddenly, the doors of the hall open, and in walks Thanos, played by Josh Brolin, who says, Supreme Intelligence, my relations with the Kree have been fair. Your planet lives, and you provide me with soldiers and anything I ask. So, why have you disappointed me by not providing me the first of my stones? Supreme Intelligence explains what happens, and Thanos nods. Well, I am a forgiving type, usually, but this sort of failure is one that I cannot allow. Wait, almighty titan, says Darben. We do offer a gift to show a remorse. He watches a small Kree child walks into the hall. This is Ronan. He is the son of two of the most powerful Kree warriors, who will grow up to be one of the most powerful Kree based on his genetics alone. He would make a great member of your army. Thanos kneels and beckons Ronan to come to him. As Ronan looks for approval from the Supreme Intelligence, she nods as Ronan goes and shakes Thanos' hand. Thanos stands. You know, I am a fan of children. You can mold them to be spitting images of yourself. While my disappointment is palpable, I will take this one as my own. As he walks away, he says... Perhaps this is the universe sending me a sign. My destiny can wait. An army will be built in my honor to help achieve my desires. He looks down at Ronan, who is holding his hand. This is but the first step in my ultimate plan. We cut to Captain Marvel flying through space, then to Nick Fury, who we see typing out a proposal for the Avengers Initiative. So we do have two post credit scenes, so in the first post credit scene... We cut a little bit closer to present day, but not entirely present day, where we see the brood planet filled with brood creatures. And if you don't know, brood creatures are these really disgusting intergalactic creatures in the comics. I'll have a picture of them on screen for you to see. But suddenly, 
we see a familiar green figure land, and it is revealed to be a Nihilus, played by Andy Serkis, who says, Why, hello there. I believe you have something for me. As we cut away, we hear Brood screaming as Nihilus attacks. And this post credit scene, for those of you who are sort of maybe confused a bit, this explains how Nihilus got the Power Stone before Fantastic Four Negative Zone. Now in the second post credit scene, we watch as Steve Rogers, played by Chris Evans, Natasha Romanoff, played by Scarlett Johansson, and Bruce Banner, played by Mark Ruffalo, are examining the pager that Nick Fury dropped at the end of Infinity War, as well as watching a live count of the death toll caused by the snap. What exactly does this pager do? asks Steve. Banner shrugs. No clue. As Natasha sighs and turns around, we see Captain Marvel standing there and asks, Where is Fury? as the movie ends. So that is Project 10 and 11 of Rebooted MCU Phase 3. Next episode might be the last episode. I have not written fully the final two projects. I'm hoping that they'll fit into one episode. That's my goal. But if not, we only have two projects left. It's kind of crazy to think about. And then we're moving on to entirely new territory. So I hope you'll get excited to find out how this saga ends. I appreciate all the support. And make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with a friend, and stay on the lookout for part six. I will see you all then.